Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's TechSoup for Libraries webinar, Cultivating a Library Technoculture. We are tech workers. My name is Crystal and I will be your host. I am very excited about our guests today who are going to share what they did in their library to establish a culture around technology and learning new tech skills. I will introduce our guests in just a few minutes. Uh, but before we begin, I have a few announcements to share. We will be using the ReadyTalk platform for our meeting today. Please use the chat in the lower left corner to send questions and comments to the presenters. We will be tracking your questions throughout the webinar and will answer them at the designated Q&A section at the end. All of your chat comments will only come to the presenters, but if you have comments or ideas to share, we will forward them back out with the entire group. You do not need to raise your hand to ask a question. Simply type it into the chat box. Should you get disconnected during the webinar, you can reconnect using the same link in your confirmation email. You should be hearing the conference audio through your computer speakers, but if your audio connection is unclear, you can dial in using the phone number that we've shared in the chat. If you are having any technical issues, please send us a chat message and we will try to assist you. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the TechSoup website. If you are called away from the webinar or if you have connection issues, you can watch a full recording of this webinar later. You will receive an archive email within a few days that will include a link to the recording, the PowerPoint slides, and any additional links or resources shared during the session. If you are tweeting this webinar, please use the hashtag TS4LIBS. We have someone from TechSoup Live tweeting this event, so please join the conversation there. TechSoup Global is dedicated to serving the world's nonprofit organizations and libraries. TechSoup was founded in 1987 with a global network of partners. We connect libraries and nonprofits to technology, resources, and support so that you can operate at your full potential, more effectively deliver your programs and services, and better achieve your missions. TechSoup has helped to distribute over 14 million software and hardware donations to date through our product donation program. We offer a wide range of software, hardware, and services, including software like Microsoft Office and refurbished computers. For more information about TechSoup product donations or services, please visit TechSoup.org and click on Get Products and Services. TechSoup for Libraries addresses the specific technology needs of public libraries. On our website, you can find blog posts, library spotlights, and sign up for our monthly newsletter. We collect and share stories of libraries that are using technology in creative and innovative ways to meet the needs of their communities. To stay up to date on the TechSoup for Libraries news and events, please be sure to visit us at TechSoupForLibraries.org. If you have a story to share about your library, you can click the link on TechSoupForLibraries.org that says, Tell Us. We'd love to hear from you. Now for today's webinar, we have two guests joining us, Pam, Sali Pam Saliba and Andrea Chiquetto, both of whom are joining us from the Markham Public Library located in the province of Ontario, Canada. Uh, Pam is a branch manager, and Andrea is the manager for learning and growth. My name is Crystal Schimpf, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Assisting us with chat and Twitter, we have Ginny Meese and Becky Wiegand from the TechSoup team. We'll be on Twitter using the at TechSoup for Libs handle. We will have time for questions throughout the webinar, so please send us your questions using the chat as they arise, and we'll address as many as we're able to. If you ask a question that we're not able to answer during the webinar, we will follow up later via email with a response. Now this webinar is being recorded and all of the slides, resources, and materials will be included in the archive of this webinar and you'll receive that within 48 hours. Uh, so now I'm going to hand the controls over to Pam and Andrea. They've teamed up on this presentation to talk about what they have done to shift culture at their library to develop innovative new service models centered around technology. Pam and Andrea? Great. Thank you, Crystal. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining Pam and I today. Uh, this is Andrea starting us off. And uh, probably you'll notice Pam and I sound a little bit alike. Um, the good news is we also think a little bit alike. So, um, so we're going to take you through uh, our, 
our presentation on how we've gone about um, kind of reconceptualizing our organizational culture so that we really embed technology as, as sort of a core feature of the work we do. Um, to start though, we wanted to kind of get a sense of where what everyone's thinking was at around this question. So if you were asked, are you a tech worker, I would like to know how you would respond. So you'll see a, a survey up on your screen. You can just click the answer that you think best describes if you feel you are a tech worker or not. Uh, and then we will start collecting some responses. Pretty cool. You get to see this like live action. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because we've done this survey each time we've presented this at a conference as well as with our own staff. And um, the results seem to have been fairly consistent. Uh, Pam and I um, were really curious to see kind of where people thought they were at because uh, depending on the nature of the library that you work in, technology may or may not be seen as sort of a central feature. So uh, it looks like we're kind of slowing down on the results. So I'm going to call it. It looks like the majority of you would say yes, you are tech workers. Um, sh followed shortly behind by maybe. Um, and that's, uh, that's great. That's, that's really cool. Uh, we think we are tech workers. Uh, and that's really what we're talking about for the rest of the, the day. Um, for staff, and there are lots of them who would not consider themselves technology workers, um, it can be a barrier. There's sort of their sense of identity around their role. Um, for those of them who, who are tech workers or who see themselves that way, um, then th this is an opportunity to discuss a little bit about how to share that energy with, with others in the organization. So to just give you a bit of context about who we are and um, where we're from, I know we have a lot of our American friends on the line today. So um, if you don't know Markham, we are a city of, I guess currently it's about 340,000 people. And we're located just north of Toronto, which is Ontario's capital. Uh, Markham sort of touts itself as Canada's high-tech capital. And that's because we have a disproportionately high number of, um, of technology and um, uh, information science companies in, located in Markham. There's about 900 companies that work in the sector here. Um, there's also, you know, our community is very diverse. We have, I think, over 70 or close to 70 percent of our population uh, are uh, visible minorities, and many of them were born outside of Canada. So we do have a very diverse population, most of whom are very highly educated. Um, for the library, we serve that community across currently seven branches, soon to be eight, um, with about 200 unionized staff members. Um, so some technology is something that we've considered part of a you know, major focus of the service that we provide for several years now. Um, but it is something that we're still struggling to, to make sure that we're meeting our customers' needs in an effective way. So hi everyone, Pam here. I'll just take it over for a little bit. So as we started to acquire new technology at the library, we noticed that some staff were really excited about our services, things like 3D printers and robotics programming, digital media labs, but many were hesitant or reluctant to engage with technology, period. Even widely used technology like tablets for mobile service or public scanners. So it was clear that we have a very wide range of abilities and comfort levels with technology, from staff comfortable with 3D design to those who are still learning to use word processors. So we gathered feedback from staff in the form of a self-assessment survey. By asking staff to evaluate their own comfort levels with technology, we recognized three myths in the way of their engagement with this technology. One is that technology is scary. Two is that it's difficult. And three, that it's just not their job. So let's bust these myths. We wanted to help staff overcome their fears and bust for them these myths. Technology is fun. We have to recognize that some people have emotional barriers stopping them from developing tech skills. Like I'm sure we've all heard colleagues say, I'm afraid I'll break it so I can't help you with this. Um, and like any other learning experience in life, learning how to use a new form of technology is scary because of the learning curve and or fear of failing. This is particularly challenging for adults since we don't want to appear incompetent in front of our colleagues or our customers. So the second myth busting is that technology can be learned. Just because it's sometimes challenging or it's all, it doesn't mean it's always challenging. It's, impo it's not impossible, and it's absolutely worth your time. It can be learned, but we have to be open to this learning and have a willingness to engage with technology and fail and try again and fail again and be comfortable with that cycle of trial and error. Some folks think that only the young can be truly comfortable with technology. 
And there are undeniable differences in how different generations interact with technology. But I think this myth is often used just to justify not having to learn a new skill. So by individuals who fear change, haven't been offered the help they require to update their skill sets. And the third myth busting is that technology is an integral part of everything we do at the library um, and it, in very various nonprofit organizations. When we teach tech skills to our community or provide access to new devices, we're just extending the age-old mandate we've always had around developing literacy skills. It's just what we do. And speaking of tech in the library, this, you're looking at here a picture of Hitchbot hanging out at the Toronto Reference Library. Hitchbot is a robot that hitchhiked safely across Canada on its own. Um, I don't know if anyone here heard about what happened to Hitchbot when he tried to travel across the U.S but he was actually found uh, decapitated in, in Philadelphia. So no, no comment there. We feel bad for Hitchbot. But, but just to say that bringing this robot into the library for people to see and engage with um, is just another type of literacy that we're, we're encouraging in our communities. And so this didn't come out um, in any of our discussions with staff or any of the self-assessment surveys, but we know we can't help but think of the stereotype of the tech worker, usually a middle-aged gentleman, um, who's asking you whether you've turned it on or off again, <laughs> uh, it, it's working against us. This is definitely working against us, particularly in libraries when we are one of the industries most dominated by female workers. So it's another layer of complexity to deal with in learning about technology. So Pam and I were both really passionate about taking a look at how we could make technology more accessible and feel more comfortable as part of staff's roles. Um, we needed to kind of take a step back and identify what's the problem we're trying to tackle here. And here's what we came up with. Um, so you know, to Pam's point about the myths that staff tell themselves, and I think that stereotypical image of a tech worker, um, that was something that we really wanted to tackle head on. So uh, I think you know, what we heard from staff is that when they think of technology workers, they think of someone who's highly specialized, who's obviously highly technical, who works in a specialized field specifically around computers or computer engineering. A lot of people said systems and networks. Um, so they're thinking of it in terms of very narrow uh, conception of the kind of work that happens in IT. Um, but we work with technology every day. Our staff are completely dependent on technology and different IT platforms in order to do the job that they do for the customer. Um, so with that level of integration, if we're that closely um, bound together with the technology we use, um, we need to really consider what is the barrier there from us thinking of ourselves as tech workers. The second problem that we wanted to look at was this one of training. So something that comes up very often, and I manage training services for the system, so this is especially a, you know, one that's dear to my heart. Um, if staff feel uncomfortable with a certain area of service or something else, very often the go-to response is around training. Uh, when we talk about uh, training and technology, a lot of the time what we hear from staff is that they're looking for um, kind of step-by-step -step instructions or an opportunity to you know, learn a process. You know, they're, they're thinking about it in terms of um, operating equipment. And I think that's because for the most part, you know, the, the language around technology used to be about it's a tool. And I think we've really evolved past that. Really it's about um, it's in integrated so fully in the services we provide. Um, and the nature of the technology we work with now and the nature of learning is not something that you can provide step-by-step -step instructions for. So we really wanted to look at how we can make a shift from staff wanting training to staff wanting learning. Um, and we see those two things as fundamentally different, and we'll elaborate a little bit on that, I think. Um, the last piece was this, this thing that Pam mentioned around tech anxiety, right? So the fear of breaking it, the fear of not being able to, um, to do something in front of a customer, fear, fear of uh, looking stupid. Um, and you know, I think that that's something that we all intrinsically feel. No one wants to feel like they look foolish in front of someone else especially when a customer comes to us for help and, and sort of cast us in the role of, of um, an expert willing to help them. What we wanted to really shift away from is that working with technology, we know there's going to be failures. What we really wanted to encourage was that sense of experimentation and a comfort learning side by side with customers. Uh, we don't expect our staff to know everything. We do expect them to be open to learning about them and being curious about how things work and being willing to use their knowledge of information searching to find the answers. And that's something that we really wanted to stress, that failure is totally acceptable and okay. Uh, it's just something that we want um, people to feel more confident in terms of being able to experiment on the, on the job. So 
what we really began thinking about is that we need to look at our organizational culture. And the reason why is that ultimately what we're talking about here is the mindsets that people have. Um, if we're going to make a shift around mindsets, then we really need to start thinking about changing um, the culture and making sure that we have a culture in place that supports uh, the kinds of learning that we want to see happen, the kind of service that we want to see happen, and the kind of comfort with technology that we really aspire to for staff. And we decided what we needed was a techno culture, um, one where technology is seen as an integral part of the service and something fun and something playful something that's worth experimenting with. Um, so this was our challenge. How do we set about um, trying to shift our culture to a techno-culture? When we're talking about culture, um, we're really talking about a collection of values that the organization holds um, as important and how these values really shape and sort of guide the decisions we make about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in terms of behavior. Um, so we knew that this was going to be a big project because if you think about it, if what culture is is a, a collection of mindsets, think about the last time you tried to change someone's mind about something that they valued very strongly, believed in very firmly, and had years of habit thinking about in a certain way. Um, so then take that and multiply it by 250 or however big your staffing is. Um, and that's kind of the challenge you're facing. Um, obviously, it's, it's a huge it's a huge amount of work and it's something that does take years, but it's something that's completely worth it because ultimately if you have an organizational culture that values and supports um, creativity and problem solving and experimentation and the acceptance of failure, you can start shifting people's outlook on, on the way they interact with technology on a daily basis. And that's where we really saw the potential to make a difference in terms of how staff thought of themselves and hopefully started to think of themselves more commonly as tech workers. All right. So I'll, talk, I'll start talking a bit about some initiatives we took to help get to a techno culture. So our first initiative was to create an easily accessible online space to help staff locate information about technology in both a fun and interactive way. So we used Pinterest. <laughs> we chose Pinterest as our platform due to its popularity and ease of use, and curated content with relevant how-to articles tech news, inspiring videos, and much more. So you can see an example here of our section on the Internet of Things. This is all geared towards staff, but can certainly be accessed by the public as well. So when doing something like this, don't assume that staff know how to use social media just because it's a popular platform. So we provided training in the form of a how-to infographic, which you're looking at a part of here. And at a leadership forum, which is a meeting we have every quarter for our supervisors and managers, we also presented hands-on training on how to use the platform so that then they can take this learning with them and encourage staff back at the branches to access the resource and help them out as, as issues come up, if they do. A second initiative that we took on as part of this project were technology lunch and learns. And this is an initiative that I especially loved because staff delivered these presentations themselves. So we were able to tap into internal expertise that already existed with the system. And staff could come out, share their lunch, and listen to a presentation on a variety of different topics delivered by their peers who had gone through a learning process themselves. So most of the people that presented in these lunch and learns uh, were not experts. They weren't people that came out of technology fields or anything like that. Um, they were other library workers that had learned, uh, learned how to interact with different kinds of tools. So they presented on a range of topics, some of them very practical. Um, so for example, how our systems work, how our maker technologies work. Some of them were very high level. Um, so more about how technology is useful in learning, um, how the Internet of Things works. Um, on the next slide, what we have here is a, a diagram from one of the Lunch and Learns that our systems librarian presented. Um, so she does have a specialized background, I will admit that. But what was interesting about this is this is all technology. These are our internal systems that staff work with every day. So it's all technology that's familiar to them. But this was one of our most talked about Lunch and Learns because so few people understood how our systems connected with each other and how they interconnect, you know, um, how something that happened in one affected the others. Um, so with Nikki presenting that information, she was able to give a perspective um, from the higher level in terms of how all of these things work together. They kind of filled in the pieces for staff. 
Um, so it was really interesting because, again, this is technology that's very familiar to them that they, they utilize daily, um, but they didn't have necessarily an overarching understanding of. So another exciting initiative we worked on is TEDx Markham Public Library. We applied for a TEDx license because it is a brand recognized as a source of reliable, exciting, and inspiring, often technology-related news. On top of this, we noticed staff were already sharing and talking about TED and TEDx videos amongst themselves. So this was also a brand that resonated with them right off the bat. So we chose Spark as our theme. TEDx provides guidelines, and it's about 100 pages of rules, to be more precise, detailing requirements of the license to maintain brand integrity. One rule is you can't have a specific theme like technology. The theme has to be abstract. So we chose Spark, partly because we wanted to spark excitement in staff around technology, but also a spark starts small but grows into something transformative and huge. Um, and this can be used for a metaphor for technology in the way a lot of applications and uses for technology are developed. We selected speakers from a diverse background, health, philosophy, design, but really emphasize technology's impact on these fields. So for example, we had Dr. Julie Lin Wong discussing her project with NASA to launch 3D printers into space. We also had a designer who theorizes that he can use technology to communicate with plants. So we made sure that every topic related back to technology, some of these are very high level and don't necessarily affect our day to day, but are inspiring and that's part of how we get people on board with a techno culture. 25% so of our audience members were staff. We released additional tickets to staff as required because we didn't want to turn anyone away, but this was certainly an event we held open to the public because we wanted the public to participate. Staff responded with a lot of enthusiasm. Many came out to say they just wanted to help us with this event. So we had a lot of staff helping us out. And we sold out of tickets very quickly, which demonstrated an interest from the public as well. And while this was culture shifting for us, we were doing the same for customers as well. We showed them that there is a new library out there, <laughs> one that drew in folks who may not see the library as a place for them. We even heard um, one of our favorite comments of the night is when our samba dancers came out. Someone said, whoa, this is not the library I grew up visiting. <laughs> An organization of the event itself was an opportunity to learn about technology used in stage production, which is a type of technology we offer through our digital media lab. Um, so for example, lighting, mic setup, projections, all of that contributed to learning for our staff team. And then part of TED's mandate for TEDx organizers is to surprise and delight our audience members with giveaways. So here's just a little bonus. We created our little TEDx Markham Public Library Lego Army as a call to the great engineering skills that can be developed by playing around and having fun with Lego from a young age. So the next initiative we'll talk about a little bit was our staff conference. So Many of your libraries might have um, professional development days or some, some opportunity to gather your staff together to, to learn together. Um, we don't have that tradition and because of our opening schedule, we're basically open everything except for statutory holidays. We don't have a lot of opportunities to bring the staff together as a group. Um, we wanted to try an experiment and say, you know, everyone goes off to, to conferences and comes back full of amazing ideas, full of a lot of energy, and then they kind of it's hard to make that transition back to their everyday life and back to their work groups, um, to their colleagues who didn't, didn't necessarily share that experience firsthand. So we wanted to try an internal conference that would get at some of that. So we, we chose the theme of technology, fitting with our overall project, um, and brought staff together over the course of three days. People came in different groupings um, and had a chance to listen to a combination of uh, different presentations on a wide range of topics. Um, that would allow them to have a better understanding of some of MPL's strategic initiatives around technology. So for example, uh, we had a lot of hands-on demonstrations that were actually run by our summer camp staff who came in and talked about some of the ways they were using technology and STEM-based learning opportunities uh, in their work with children. Um, our staff, including in this picture here, it's two of our borrower services clerks, um, got a chance to get their hands on that, those, those different technologies and start exploring, uh, building, and kind of having fun with it. We also had, again, an opportunity to call on our internal experts to come out and speak about 
their own experiences with technology. Um, the slide here, um, this is one of our staff called um, Faisal Issa. And Faisal is a sound artist in addition to a library techno worker. Um, and he came and talked about how he had used library technology to produce uh, a record that he had made called uh, The Roar and got to play some of it with us. So it was a really excellent example of someone who, you know, again, he's self-taught and he embodied a lot of the principles that we were trying to support our staff with in terms of experimentation and learning. Um, but he's also their colleague, so hearing from their peer directly about um, his experience using some of um, the library's resources in, in the pursuit of his art was really powerful. And then lastly, we also had external experts come in to do, uh, to do presentations in each session. And these again ranged in topics. Some of them were very directly related to libraries and some of them weren't at all. Um, so for example, in this presentation we had um, from the University of Toronto, the uh, Technologies for Aging Gracefully Lab. Um, so this is an organization that works on developing tech that helps support um, elders in the community um, learning how to um, connect and kind of use technology for, for better social cohesion. So there was a really wide range of topics. Um, for many of our staff, you know, the feedback that we got fairly consistently was that um, they loved the opportunity to think about technology from a different perspective. Um, so rather than just thinking about the photocopy is broken, how do I fix it, started thinking about you know, what is it that our customers are looking for? What are the trends in society that technology are going to help shape? And more than anything, we really wanted to, to emphasize how fun technology could be. So a lot of the, the days over the course of the conference were focused on how much, um, how much opportunity there is in terms of what's out there um, for, for us to learn and experiment and basically play together. So we have a little video to show you um, of our staff programming their first robot. Um, many of the, the, the comments that we heard first were, I can't do this, I don't know anything about this, this isn't my, this isn't my jam. Uh, as soon as they got their hands on it and had an opportunity to start pushing those buttons, it was a totally different story. I hope you heard the sounds of excited um, squealing and uh, carrying on <laughs> that happened. Uh, and I also love it how our staff show up to everything with matching shoes. <laughs> um, one of the more recent uh, initiatives that we took on as part of this project was the Digital Artist in Residence. So we, um, you know, many libraries I think have experimented with writers in residence and other kinds of um, artistic projects essentially. We wanted to explore what it would be like to have a digital artist working out of the library space. Um, so we took on uh, in a residency uh, a Markham-based artist, Stephanie Wu, um, who works primarily in the medium of GIF. Um, so again, she had attended, uh, I can't remember what she said her background now was, I should have checked beforehand, some kind of arts degree basically from uh, McGill University in Montreal, um, and came to us really excited to contribute to the artistic development of the community. Um, she had pitched to us a project basically that looked at how we can engage communities in a project that explored the concept of escape um, and how it looked at kind of the process of being present. Uh, so her theme was around, you know, people came in, they took a picture of themselves and then illustrated a background that represented a place that they, they want to be, either a place that they already are and want to be or a place that, uh, that they want, um, want to go to. Um, so we're exploring uh, lots of concepts around identity and things like that that are, are um, really important questions in art, but doing that through technology that's available in the library. Um, and because it's a local artist as well, Stephanie is very um, accessible and open to customers of all ages and our staff to be able to share her learning and experience. So it was a really wonderful initiative to kind of, again, start bringing the, sort of emphasizing the link between community and staff and the role that technology plays in combining those things. So another initiative we launched was called the eBook Blitz. So the eBook Training Blitz came about from feedback from staff about the amount of time and anxiety they spend helping customers with their troubleshooting in terms of eBook downloading specifically. So we, we made this tra training a requirement for all information services staff, regardless of their comfort level, and we also opened it up to borrower services staff as well. Those are our circulation clerks. 
Um, so we, we framed the training around troubleshooting both Android and Apple devices and had people come together to go through the typical training pro uh, troubleshooting process. So our goal is to help them understand that the process to troubleshoot ebook issues is no different from running through the reference interview. You ask a lot of questions, you research the issue in depth to help the customer as much as you possibly can. And ebooks may add a layer of complexity in terms of the technology used, but it's certainly the sim a very similar process. So now this all sounds great, but we received a lot of mixed feedback from this initiative in particular from staff um, after it was done. So although it was valuable to review the troubleshooting process, many staff found the training was just too simple. In fact, in many of the sessions, staff transformed the training themselves. So they transformed our planned content into more of a support group style discussion. These discussions were rich with examples of the most common or most challenging ebook issues. And by coming together and engaging in conversations amongst themselves about these common issues, staff shared tips and tricks, and they developed confidence in their own abilities and confidence as well that they can call on their colleagues for assistance as it's required. And so although those conversations were great, we still took our initial plans to something we have at MPL called Fail Camp. So Fail Camp is another initiative we have developed by one of our superstar employees, Megan Garza. Fail Camp encourages staff to take their work failures to a safe Fail Camp fire where they can share their failures with staff, share their learnings, and celebrate the failure for what it is, a solid attempt at making an improvement. So for example, we recorded our Fail Camp discussion and distributed to staff like a podcast. Staff told us they were impressed that three managers were willing to share their failures with them. And technology is scary to some people because they're afraid of failing at it, like we've brought up a couple times before. Maybe if we realize that not much is accomplished without a string of failed attempts first, we can learn and improve from our failures, and tech can be a little bit less intimidating to us. And so yet another initiative. This one wasn't necessarily under a project, but ended up uh, sort of like a spin-off from a project, the project that Andrea and I worked on. It's called Media Mentors. And it's organized by one of our community librarians, Ben Shaw. Each branch identified two media mentors, one each from the Circulation and Information Services Department. These individuals were selected because they demonstrated that they were not afraid to play around with technology. And the media mentors went through weekly technology assignments to help them better use and troubleshoot commonly used products, things like Microsoft products, Google products. Then they used their learnings as well as their previous knowledge base to help staff when tricky tech situations came up in the branch. So here what you're looking at is a screenshot from Yammer. Yammer is our enterprise social network. Think of it like Facebook but for work. And you can see here are media mentors discussing their assignments with each other. So they're all very engaging initiatives, but you know, both for the organizers and for the participants. But a very important question here is have we made a difference? We surveyed staff and they told us that 96% of them learned something new about technology from the initiatives that we put forth. 32% of staff, perhaps more importantly, reported being more confident in their abilities to resolve tech-related issues. And confidence is in one's abilities is crucial when providing awesome customer service. Because you can really tell when a person feels uncomfortable that is very visible in the way that they deliver messages and in the way that they go through um, with their help. And here's some feedback we received from our staff technology conference in particular. There was a lot of buzz and excitement around these learning opportunities. This is not always the response we received from staff. Uh, and our goal was to get staff excited and happy about learning technology. And we're certainly continuing to work towards this goal every day. It's not an overnight process. But this type of feedback is encouraging. It lets us know we're heading in the right direction. So we thought we would, in the spirit of Fail Camp, talk a little bit about things we might have done differently or improve on uh, were we to take on the project again. Um, because as much as we did feel this project was definitely a success, there are some things that we, we learned from that were really valuable. So uh, one of the things that, that we were looking at in retrospect was around the team and who's going to be involved in, these, um, in an initiative like this. Um, something that I think can be very challenging is bringing people to the table in a consistent way because 
ultimately we're very leanly staffed, as many libraries are, um, and time is precious. And most customer and most staff are engaged in direct customer service, so it can be really challenging to kind of pull people away from that. Um, but having said that, the more we involved staff in initiatives, uh, the richer those initiatives became, and I think the more resonance they had with their their colleagues. Um, so definitely thinking about who you put together at the table around creating a culture change. Um, definitely consider involving um, as much frontline staff as possible, as many people who can speak peer to peer to each other. Um, the parts of the project that I think were were really effective were when we had um, candidates or not candidates rather, but um, staff from inside the system who had who was able to speak firsthand about how they learned and um, and explored for themselves um, how technology worked in their job and in, in, um, in the community. Scope creep is a common problem on basically all projects, especially one like this, because it's huge. And there's so much in our work that technology touches. Um, and it also created a lot of energy. And so this is a really positive thing. Um, Pam talked about media mentors and how that was kind of a spin-off project. Ultimately, we kept seeing that kind of like, hey, we should do this thing next, right? And that desire to kind of continue to grow the project. Uh, it's a really nice problem to have, but it was something that, in terms of being able to resource the program, the project effectively, um, being able to manage scope was something that we probably could have improved on in retrospect. Um, and kind of similar to that was the ability to pace ourselves. Um, so as I mentioned before, we knew going into it that any sort of organizational culture change work takes a huge amount of time and effort and really becomes um, an immersive experience. Uh, so being able to give yourself enough time to allow things to take root, um, to allow momentum and energy to build uh, was something that, was, that we, we probably could have left more space for. Um, partly that was honestly, we were just so pumped to work on this. Um, so again, a nice problem to have, but one that, that we really, in retrospect, um, you know, we probably should have been less uh, aggressive with some of our timelines. And last but not least, there are always going to be people who are going to hold out and who are not going to buy in, who aren't going to be interested in, in an initiative like this, um, who firmly still feel that you know, libraries are libraries and technology is the thing they have to deal with in the library. Um, and that was something that we did encounter. You know, not, it was not a 100% buy-in, um, nor did we expect it to be. You know, if we got 32% on this first year of staff feeling more confident, um, because this is a work in progress, if we can get another 32% this year, uh, we're going to continue to see that positive momentum work in our favor. Realistically though, we, we recognize that there's always going to be some staff who, who are never going to see themselves as tech work workers. Um, and as sad as that makes us, I think it's a good opportunity to kind of reality check expectations. Um, so those are some of the things that we learned. We also wanted to share a little bit about um, how this might work in other library contexts. All right, so let's talk a bit about how you can get this started at your library. So how to start your learning journey. Now this is certainly not supposed to replace uh, formal project management training or an in-depth knowledge of what it's like to manage a project, but here are some big high level things that you need to get started on. So one is you want to identify passionate staff. Before the project launched, we held an unconference style day um, for staff across the system from all positions we gathered feedback on what type of technology they were excited to learn about in the library context. So that got people excited. And then the unconference, unconference model allowed staff to identify those topics that they wanted to talk about and learn about. It was bottom up. It wasn't us forcing topics onto staff. It was them telling us what our customers are asking about, what they encounter most often, and what would be most relevant to their work. And so through this model, we were able to identify staff that could help us with the project as well, because they demonstrated uh, either a knowledge base that would be helpful or enthusiasm that would certainly benefit a long-term project like this. Then you need to ask yourself, why do you need this project? In project management, answering the why question is the most important thing that you can do because it helps guide your decision making. And it helps justify your project as well. Um, so what is it about your organization's attitude towards technology that needs changing? Um, if you really want to get your senior team on board, you're going to have to be able to answer this question very well. So you need to ask yourself, why? Then, like any good project, it needs a project charter, a guiding document, something that helps you maintain scope, that helps you make decisions 
Um, but let your project charter be a living document because changes happen inevitably. Either funding you thought you had disappeared, or um, you realize that you absolutely missed out on a learning opportunity that needs to be incorporated. So allow this document to be a living document, but of course be mindful of scope at the same time. And that sounds very challenging, and it is, but it's something that any project manager has to keep in mind. So Long-term projects are going to change. There's no doubt, especially when technology is involved. And that's part of why you want to keep it um, flexible if possible. Then you want to find your sponsor, of course. So you need to get your senior team on board. And that's why I mentioned earlier answering that why question. So getting your CEO as your sponsor, for example, will hopefully help your senior team be aligned in how they approach this project and ensure that you have the resources needed to complete the project. You have to advocate on behalf of tech learning in the library. It would be great if we didn't have to, but we absolutely do. And so if you're going to embark on this type of journey, you have to be able to advocate. And staff time is very expensive. So you have to understand from the senior team side, of course, they want to make sure they're making most efficient use of our resources. And so being able to answer that why question is going to help them decide what resources are allocated to you. And lastly, this is certainly a bit cliched, but I think it rings true. You have to have fun while learning. It's hard for people to turn away fun. If you frame your learning activities as fun, uh, include challenges, have some hands-on activities, not just a PowerPoint slide at the front of the room, um, you're going to get people excited and engaged in what it is that they're learning. And it's especially important when folks are scared of technology. If you show them how fun it can be, that can eliminate some of the fear as well. So first and foremost, our project is about culture. It's not about training, it's about culture. It's about embedding an individual's uh, comfort with technology and a willingness to experiment, a willingness to fail. You'll have staff who are more comfortable experimenting with technology. You'll have staff who are more comfortable learning the skills and more, with more confidence in their abilities. Hopefully they won't dread those technology questions. Hopefully they will embrace eBooks and all kinds of new technology in the library. Um, and hopefully they'll be more resilient and happier as well. So that's it for our presentation portion. Uh, thank you guys very much for, for being here. And I, I, I get to see all the questions. I realize you don't get to see each other's questions yet. Sorry, Crystal. <laughs> I started answering some of them, but I've stopped that. But we can certainly begin um, answering some questions since we've got some time. Absolutely. And we have had a lot of excellent questions coming in. Uh, so Pam and Andrea, thank you for uh, such a, a well thought out presentation. And I know you've delivered this in, in person um, before and now bringing it to the online environment. We've uh, certainly seen a lot of questions coming in. Before we start answering them, I just wanted to remind everyone that you'll actually get a recording of this in your email. And some of the links that we've been sharing in the chat will be included in that archive. So we'll make sure to get you those links if you're not tracking them right now. Um, we'll get those to you. Um, and, and you know, I think a good place to start off with this question, or with the questions, um, is maybe to work our way uh, backwards. Um, and, and you were just giving some great advice on how to get started at your library. And I know we've got people joining from all different sizes of libraries and organizations. And they've had some really good questions. Um, and the, the one I'd like to start with is you mentioned how important it was to have uh, some, some uh, you called it a sponsor. And sometimes people refer to that as buy-in or support from senior administration. But I don't recall, did you mention who, where your support came from within your organization? Did you have full support of your administrative team? Or did it come from a specific department? Could you tell us more? And yeah. Pam, maybe we'll start with you. <laughs> it's actually Andrea. I'm going to respond to okay. this question. If that's oh, okay. good, good. So part of um, so something that's kind of unique at, at MPL. My role uh, is uh, as a part of the senior management team is to work on organizational development. So that includes training, but it also includes change and different kinds of initiatives that affect the organizational culture. Um, so there was kind of a tradition in place or, or sort of a, a nice platform, I guess, to, um, to launch initiatives like this. Um, so a lot of my, my work will look like these kinds of projects. Um, my role in that is really providing a connection between um, Pam and the project team and the senior management team. Um, having said that though, I mean ultimately our sponsor is our CEO. Um, and uh, our CEO, Catherine Biss, is always very open to initiatives that we undertake that look at issues of organizational culture. 
um, which is sometimes kind of rare to find. They tend to be long and hard to, um, like the, the results aren't immediate, so it can be kind of hard to um, talk about it in terms of ROI or you know, what am I getting out of this right away. Um, you know, but recognizing it as a long-term investment in the staff um, is something that Catherine is really, um, really savvy about. So we had a lot of support for this initiative, I guess partly because of the way we're structured, um, but our, also partly because we have a, a senior team who, um, who sees the value or sort of understands the importance of making sure that we're developing staff in order to provide better service to our customers. And that's ultimately the path to um, sort of maintaining our, our position in the community and continuing to provide services there. Excellent. Excellent. And then just a quick question about your staffing. I saw earlier that you have about 220 staff. And do you know a rough percentage of what staff are part-time or, you know, is it, uh, you know, if you just have any rough idea there that you could share? Yeah, it's pretty high. So that 70, 75 percent of our staffing is part-time. Wow. And uh, so I guess that begs the question is, was that a challenge for you to have so many part-time staff involved with this initiative? Um, and how did you uh, address that challenge? Yeah, this is Pam here. Yeah, it was certainly a challenge, of it, particularly in terms of uh, scheduling training. So we, in every initiative, we have to be mindful, how could we make this easy on branch staff? Because we're actually quite leanly staffed. It sounds like we have a lot of people, but we, because they're mostly part-time, we don't have a lot of people every day in the branch, right? Um, yeah, we're extraordinarily busy. Like we're um, constantly in need of more staff to help with the amount of customers coming in through our doors. So we have to be mindful of that. Um, and in terms of the project team, um, we didn't necessarily, we might do this differently um, in hindsight or next time, um, but we didn't necessarily involve a lot of the part-time staff in that. So we had full-timers helping on the committee, and we were working together on projects that we could then roll out to the part-timers. Um, things like Pinterest, right, that can be done at the branch, like when, it's, when there are the very rare <laughs> downtime, <laughs> um, or perhaps we can take someone um, aside and give them a chance to work in the back for a bit and look through Pinterest, for example. Um, the lunch and learns, another good example of us working around time, those were on lunch time, so we weren't taking away from floor coverage. Uh, and something like the staff conference, which was especially popular with staff and was very well received, um, spanned over three days. Not all, the ex expectation was not that staff could attend all three days. That We knew that was an impossibility. But by having different options for them, like mornings, you know, afternoons, evenings, and dividing up the days into uh, portions where you could experience at any, if you come in from 9 to 1 or 1 to 5 or 5 to 9, you could experience a hands-on component, an external speaker, an internal speaker. You had a similar experience, um, but it still worked with the schedule because we just couldn't. There's just no way that we could send everybody to the full three days. So it, it posed almost logistical uh, challenges. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and actually it's great to hear some of the examples of how you dealt with that challenge. So thanks for sharing them. Um, another question related to time that has come up, and actually a few people have asked this, is what was the time span from when you started this initiative uh, to uh, kind of where we are right now, or when you would say you had, had reached your goal? So it was roughly a year. and. Um, so Pam and I sort of started talking about it, and I think the seeds were kind of planted maybe a little bit further out than that. But from the time of kind of getting our project charter approved and then really starting to roll with the initiatives, it was about a year's time. Um, some things like our digital artists in residence, just because of the timing that we wanted to launch that initiative kind of fell into the next year, but the bulk of it was, was kind of done within a year. Uh, now, also speaking to staff, and particularly the assessment uh, that you referenced early on, I know you mentioned that that assessment gauged their comfort level um, mm -hmm. or how comfortable they were. Um, but we had a question about whether that also gauged their interests or their um, like strengths and weaknesses with technology. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So it, it did. It actually um, it included how I mean, it was a self-assessment, I should say. So um, so it asked staff to identify essentially where they felt their skill level was. Um, we asked. Uh, I don't think we specifically asked about interest, but we did have questions that spoke to how they use technology in their personal life. So 
uh, you know, do you have a smartphone, that kind of thing. So, so we got a, a sense of kind of where people's interests were, how um, tech enriched their, their lives were, I guess, based on some of those answers. But, um, but we did get a sense of what, how they assessed their own skill. Um, and it was interesting to kind of correlate that against what they saw as their, their comfort level. The other thing that was kind of interesting at looking at those results was um, we had a chance to discuss it with our management team. And in some cases, the, their managers assessed them differently, both um, more upwards and more downwards. So in some cases, staff thought they were really good with technology and their managers begged to differ. In other cases, and more commonly I think, is that managers felt that their staff exhibited a lot of comfort with technology and a lot of skill where the staff member themselves kind of underrated their abilities. So it was interesting to kind of see how some of those results played out. But it was a, kind of an interesting starting point to have to see you know, how far we can move the needle, especially on the issue of comfort. You know, again, we were trying to uh, really affect mindset, and we thought comfort would be um, kind of a good indicator of that. Excellent. Um, now, we have had a few requests. I don't know if the assessment is in a format that you would be willing to share as part of the archive of that, but is that something we'd be able to include in the archive later? Sure. We can, um, we can send the questions. We won't share the results necessarily, but we'll send all the questions. <laughs> Of course, good. Yeah, so we'll um, include that self-assessment in with the uh, archive then, um, and and you'll have uh, the questions for that assessment later on. So that was a great question. Um, now we're also getting a lot of uh, interest in some of the specific um, uh, pieces that you talked about, and actually just another bit about the assessment um, when you did the ebook training. Um, did you do any specific assessment related to the ebooks, or uh, you know anything related to that ebook work? Um, we didn't do a formal assessment in that case. Although the overall assessment we did at the start of the project asked about ebooks, so we did have some data from that. Um, the thing that we did with that project, we because we do um, we call them bring your own device or BYODs. I think uh, it's a customer program where essentially staff make themselves available for an hour, I guess it is, or maybe a little longer, um, to work one-on-one -on -one with customers who have more in-depth, complicated questions or, or need to learn more about it, um, how to use their, their smartphone or other device. Uh, so we have, um, after each session of that program is held, we have a, a staff debrief where they have an opportunity to exchange amongst themselves sort of what the hard questions they were asked, um, you know, what they learned out of the experience. So there is a... Um, we do get a lot of feedback out of that experience where, where we sort of keep our eye on what questions are coming up that staff find challenging or um, didn't feel like they were able to answer correctly. So we have a process in place that monitors that, but it's not a formal assessment in the same way. All right. Um, we're also getting questions about the uh, fail camp uh, that you mentioned, and of course this uh, idea of how do we support failure as a means of learning and, and growing in our libraries. Um, so uh, we have a couple questions about the format of that, um, and if you have any examples you might be able to share later, um, or, or if you could just talk a bit more about what you did in the fail camp to help bring that concept to the forefront. Sure. So, um, so I think this is actually, um, Pam mentioned Megan Garza, who's one of our branch managers, although she was, I think, a branch librarian at the time, maybe. Um, she came up with this uh, based on an experience she'd had going to a fail camp at a conference level for, um, I forget what, but uh, it's something that does happen kind of in the tech sector quite often. As far as we knew at the time, it wasn't something that, that had happened in a library at an organization level, because it can be really challenging to get up in front of your peers and talk about um, basically how you screwed up. Uh, what we wanted to do was, first of all, create some definitions around innovation and failure, and make sure that it wasn't seen as a license to do your job poorly. Rather, the idea with Fail Camp is that if you're trying to innovate, if you're trying to um, improve something, if you're trying to introduce something new, um, there are going to be misfires, and there needed to be an opportunity to, to take that apart and really look at what went wrong or what could have been improved so that we can learn from those experiences. Um, so it was about reversing that tendency that I think we all have to try to gloss over mistakes or kind of sweep them under the rug. Um, and do that at, at an organizational level. So uh, we actually wrote a, pro a charter of fail that, um, that we had signed by our CEO that basically said, yep, there's no reprisal if for someone who, who fails, uh, if it's in the effort of, of improvement or innovation, and if they're willing to learn from that failure. Um, so we have different ways that we implement fail camps. We do have, um, as part of 
uh, some different uh, training initiatives as part of uh, staff meetings. Um, we've used it in um, even staff onboarding. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the time we'll connect it to customer service as well and say, you know, what kind of customer service sales have you had? Uh, where staff can, can exchange stories about um, customer interactions that didn't go the way they would have liked. Um, so we do have different in-person in kinds of um, formats that we can tie into other meetings. Uh, we also, Pam mentioned Yammer, so we have a virtual fail camp where um, over our, our internal social media tool, um, staff can kind of write up their fail experience. Uh, very recently we started essentially podcasting our fails. Um, so Megan will record us talking about um, fail camps and sort of what's gone wrong. An example of one that I can share uh, is um, we, we have this a different culture change project around our customer service initiative. Um, that we called the customer service revolution. And we were looking for a way to recognize staff that really did outstanding work in the area of, of customer service, so build in this kind of recognition program. And uh, one of the suggestions that we decided to run with was the idea of having um, gold stars and being able to, for staff to recognize each other, for customers to recognize staff. You know, it was one of those things where it's like, yeah, that sounds cute, yeah, you know, awesome, who doesn't love stickers? Um, as it turned out, the majority of our staff did not love that idea, right? Um, so I had the opportunity to take that to fail camp based on the feedback I was getting. Um, and it was a lot of stuff like, you know, that feels really um, juvenile or like it, d it made me feel a little devalued, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it gave me an opportunity to kind of reflect on, you know, I think what I did wrong in that was not have a chance to kind of get some in input from people, um, not really test whether or not that would be the kind of appreciation anyone would support. So fail camp kind of let me take that apart a little bit and say, you know, what what went wrong with this, right? Because it's a well-intentioned idea, it's just it was um, not the right idea for that moment. So that's the kind of thing that might come up in a fail camp. Um, and we, like I said, we have a lot of customer service lines, um, a lot of uh, learning. <laughs> a lot of them come from me, which makes me feel a little worried now. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, failing is all about learning, and I think that that's what we really try to stress with staff, that um, you're not going to essentially progress if you're not willing to, to stumble sometimes. If I could add one quick thing about failing, Andrea, you saying a lot of them come from you. I think that's because Andrea really demonstrates a willingness to talk about failure as a tool or a process towards innovation. Um, so it's like we're talking about fail camp. We love it. Andrea and I both love it. It's not something that's loved across the board. So it's certainly something that if you take to your organizations, you have to be mindful. A lot, like Andrea was saying, a lot of people are un uncomfortable with it. But yeah. I commend Andrea oh, for all of it. Oh, yeah. thanks, man. <laughs> it's awesome. Very supportive here. <laughs> Great. And uh, we had somebody share a, a link which we put back out in the chat about um, some uh, more resources about learning to fail and that being part of a 21st century skill set. So it's, it's great yeah. to see that you're addressing it. And I think those examples were very helpful. Um, now we're very close to the end of our time here. And um, so I think we are, are going to need to wrap up. Um, we got so many great questions, and I just want to assure you, if you asked a question and we haven't been able to uh, respond to that live, then we will uh, follow up via email um, with an answer. And some of your questions are very specific, so we want to make sure to get you accurate answers. So we'll follow up via email there. And uh, the archive of, of the webinar will be coming out within the next few days. Um, now we have just maybe one more minute, and I have one last question I want to ask is that, um, and if either of you want to address this briefly, is how do you balance uh, the need for human interaction to continue? That came up in one of our uh, comments in the chat that you know, with all of this technology and all of these technological services we're providing, how do you maintain that personal connection to your community and your library patrons? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, so I'll start and maybe turn it over to Pam for, for her thoughts as well. Um, my, my first reaction is that th there's absolutely room for both. And I think um, sometimes that's about different people needing different things. Um, sometimes that's about using technology or technology solutions to enhance the human interaction. So one example, you know, I think we have a lot of um, uh, people in our community that are interested. I mean, our community is passionate about learning. Uh, and we know that from a lot of research we've done in terms of their, their needs and preferences. Um, so the more we can use um, technology-based solutions to open up access to learning opportunities, you know, we're fulfilling a need that, that our customers have. And staff play a role in that in terms of the way that they build relationship with our customers and kind of um, bring, bring those resources to them. Uh, we have an entire department focused on community development that works embedded in the community uh, that really focuses on, you know, hey, what is it that we can do to 
um, to create solutions around change in the community. And a lot of the time it is about making sure that we're, we're bringing uh, the, the right solution, whether it's technological or not, to bear in a situation. Yeah, I mean, well, and actually I'm afraid we are out of time, so I'm going to have to hold the rest of that for later. Um, but I want to make sure we get everybody out of here. But that was a great way to respond to that, Andrea, and a great way to wrap up our webinar and our topic today. Um, so if everyone uh, participating, thank you for joining us. Stay on the line for a minute because we've got a survey coming up. Um, and thanks again, Pam and Andrea, for sharing all of this information. Uh, just one last word here. I want to let you know about two upcoming webinars that might interest you. Uh, Tuesday, August 9th, we're talking about Web Accessibility 101. And Wednesday, August 24th, almost a month from now, uh, we're going to be talking about social media analytics for libraries. So mark your calendars for those, and there will be more coming out in, in our newsletters about that. Um, thanks to ReadyTalk for being our sponsor today, and thanks again to all of you for joining us. Uh, it's been a great hour, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Have a good one. Bye-bye.